Welcome to today's webinar, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Anna Hobson, and I will be moderating today. Today's webinar is in partnership with Fisher Phillips, and we have Greg Gresham presenting for us today. You can enter any questions you have for him in the question and answer box, and we will get to them throughout the webinar or at the end of the webinar. To view more webinars, you can go to hrsimple.com forward slash events, and we will have all of our upcoming events from Chamber of Commerce that we work with, as well as reputable law firms like Fisher Phillips. Greg has presented for us before, and you can view any of his past webinars at hrsimple.com forward slash events under our recorded webinars. He is of counsel in the Memphis office and for 30 years has successfully counseled and represented employers in all areas of labor and employment law. His practice includes all areas of labor and employment law, including helping employers avoid claims, charges, and lawsuits with a focus on preventative practices in the representation of business entities subject to Title III of the ADA in public accommodation cases. He has successfully litigated hundreds of administrative charges, employment lawsuits, and arbitration demands on behalf of employers, including federal and state law claims. He also represents employers before the NLRB and unfair labor practice proceedings. So on that note, I'm going to hand things over to Greg so we can go ahead and get the presentation started. All right. Well, thank you very much, Anna. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here. All righty. Uh, as Anna says, I'm, I'm back presenting for HR Simple. It's always a pleasure to do so. I enjoy working with Anna and HR Simple and our uh, law firm. Uh, Joy's partner with him as well. So uh, Anna contacted me about a month or so ago, and we talked about a good topic for a sort of year-end seminar. And we, we came to the conclusion that looking at significant federal labor and employment legal developments in 2021 would be a good topic. You know, I was... Uh, I always have enjoyed, uh, you know, when you get toward the end of the year, you get, uh, you know, the greatest hits of, you know, 2020 or 2021, you listen to the greatest song, you know, the most popular songs. So we've had a very busy year uh, in labor and employment law. Uh, we've been very busy. You know, I know our clients uh, and employers in general have been very busy dealing with a lot of issues. So we see that uh, that trend is going to continue. Uh, into the next year. So let's, what, we're, what I wanted to do is just look at some of the key things uh, that happened, um, um, you know, some of the cases, some of the legislation, some of the regulatory changes. There always, there's always a lot of change when a new administration takes over, uh, particularly from a different political party. So we're going to talk about those. Um, uh, our, the presentation's apolitical today. We're not going to say whether the changes are good or bad. We're just going to identify them. Uh, and people can make up their own mind about it. But um, so here we go. And, and feel free to ask questions if you have questions as we go, for, go through. Uh, President Barack Obama said after he was elected in 2009, elections have consequences. And that's that's absolutely true. Every time we at the federal level get a new president, the president has a lot of opportunity to to uh, to, to to change things dramatically. Uh, through appointing, um, you know, new officials to the government, various government agencies, particularly the ones that control uh, labor and employment law, like the Department of Labor, the EOC, uh, and the LRB, and uh, also judges. Of course, uh, presidents uh, nominate judges, and uh, you know, in a lot of our cases. Uh, you know, we deal in federal court, deal with federal judges, uh, I guess the majority of time, although we do a lot more in state court than we used to. And uh, that makes a big difference um, uh, in the judges that get appointed. So that's a very profound saying, and, it, and it's very true. Now, President Biden came in um, with, a, with an agenda, um, you know, that was, that, that was laid out in his campaign, uh, and he wanted to do things differently. Um, you know, he, he, when he took over, he revoked on day one a number of executive orders that President uh, Trump had signed, um, uh, which is pretty common, commonly happens regardless of who 
who leaves and who takes over. Uh, he was very focused on um, worker health and safety. Um, he really, from day one, uh, he wanted OSHA to issue more guidance on COVID-19, also considered emergency uh, standards on COVID-19, and was encouraging them to um, be more aggressive in enforcement. Um, also, uh, economic relief related to COVID-19 pandemic uh, was also a priority uh, for President Biden. With the executive order, um, he, he focused on the federal workforce, uh, raised the um, federal contractor pay to $15 minimum wage, which was a big, big uh, upswing. Uh, called for emergency pay leave for federal workers and also uh, uh, gave federal workers the right to refuse to work if they perceive the safety threat, which, which private sector workers have. Um, also, uh, in a nod to organize labor, create a task force on worker organizing and empowerment. And he's had many others uh, that have come along. So uh, executive orders, um, uh, you know, uh, pre presidents use them in varying degrees. Uh, but President Biden so far has made good use of executive orders to uh, try to make policy changes. So he, so when, one way you make policy changes, not only writing executive orders, issuing them, but also uh, in the people that you appoint to positions. Uh, uh, Marty Walsh was nominated uh, to be Secretary of Labor, and he was confirmed by the Senate. Uh, he's a former union leader and Boston mayor. Uh, he's pretty well respected, but of course he has a, uh, you know, a different, uh, a pro-labor, um, you know, viewpoint. And uh, so anyway, he's running the show at the Department of Labor. He's a, you know, pretty it's a pretty big change from uh, 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 from Mr. Scalia, who ran it before. Uh, Jim Frederick, head of OSHA, uh, former still working safety official. Uh, you know, you can expect OSHA to continue to be aggressive uh, in going after, uh, you know, enforcement efforts under Mr. Frederick. Uh, Jennifer Bruzzo uh, also was a, an attorney for the communication workers. She was appointed general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the NLRB. NLRB is one of the most important agencies. It really uh, has a big, big say over uh, 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 labor policy in the US. We'll talk more about them later. Other personnel changes, um, you know, you, you, they're listed here. Uh, the Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division. Um, um, Ms. Lauren McFerrin she was, uh, was already an NLRB member, but uh, President Biden made her uh, chairman of the LRB and a number of other former Biden era officials uh, were appointed to key positions, which, uh, you know, it's, uh, you see that typically in Washington, you see people get recycled. Somebody will work for one president, uh, a new president will come in and they'll come back in the, usually in a, usually in a different capacity, sometimes in the same capacity. So we're seeing that, uh, you know, we're seeing that with President Biden. Uh, President Obama, uh, the Department of Labor, LRB, and EOC were, were all very aggressive under, uh, under the Obama administration. So I think we're going to see, see those same policies uh, continue to, uh, to, to uh, take root under President Biden. Now, one thing President Biden did, which was controversial, um, the National Labor Relations Board is supposed to be an independent agency. And their uh, uh, their general counsels are are nominated and confirmed by the Senate, I believe, for four year terms. And uh, Mr. Robb uh, had been uh, nominated by uh, President Trump, confirmed by the Senate, so his term was not up. Uh, and uh, President Clinton, I mean, President Trump, as I recall, allowed the uh, the general counsel uh, that had served under President Obama to stay in until his. Uh, his term was up. So uh, anyway, there was a lot of controversy about it. Um, President Biden fired Rob, I believe, on day one. Also, Alice Stock took over uh, uh, his interim general counsel. I think she was in office maybe less than a day, and he also fired her when they wouldn't resign. Uh, and of course, all the cabinet members were asked to resign. Uh, so once again, you know, you make policy changes not only by executive orders and proposed legislation, but also in the people that you 
you know, point to these positions. Uh, you know, all of us, uh, you know, uh, all of us are inundated with information about COVID-19 you know, vaccinations. That's really a big topic today in a lot of different contexts. So we're going to kind of do an overview of what's happened this year. Uh, we're not going to go into great detail, but it's important to look and see um, see what the policies have been and where we are now so we understand you know, where we're headed. Uh, EOC guidance on uh, vaccination incentives. Um, I remember back um, earlier in the year, we had, uh, uh, I was able, had the pleasure of interviewing uh, uh, Commissioner, EOC Commissioner Keith Sonderling for our annual uh, um, uh, corporate council uh, conference uh, about various things. And one of the things was on <clears throat> wellness and uh, vaccination incentives. And uh, in May, in the, or the end of May, they issued um, updated guidance, uh, which gives employers two clear options. Um, you know, a lot of companies uh, you know, have adopted mandatory uh, vaccination policies. Uh, others, others have left it to be voluntary. Uh, but let's see what the EOC guidance said. There are really two options. Um, if you have, if employees voluntarily provide documentation showing that they've been vaccinated from some third party healthcare provider, uh, like a pharmacy or, um, you know, uh, a clinic or something, you can offer them really any incentive you like without uh, limitations. Uh, if you've got an, if, if you're the employer, you the employer are administering the vaccine, if you have health, you know, occupational nurses doing it, um, you can still offer incentives, but not so much as to be coercive, all right? And so, um, so really the key is for, for the unlimited incentives, it's got to be voluntarily, employees voluntarily provide the documentation or other confirmation that they have been vaccinated and that they get the, uh, the vaccination from a third party provider that is not connected or is not considered to be an agent of, uh, <clears throat> agent of, your, of your organization. And there are a lot of, a lot of places uh, that provide the shots, um, health, public health departments, pharmacies, uh, you know, all of us, many of us have had COVID-19 vaccinations, um, uh, you know, and we're all, now many of us have had boosters or thinking about it. Um, there are a lot of different options for that uh, other than your employer. Um, so anyway, uh, once again, uh, the incentives are different depending on who you get vaccinated by, uh, but, it, um, but it has to be voluntary uh, under the uh, EUC guidance. Uh, what, about, uh, what about incentives uh, related, for, related to family members? Um, well, you can't offer incentives to employee in return for family members getting vaccinated uh, by your organization or, uh, or your agent. Um, uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's an important, uh, important lesson we pull from the guidance. Uh, another thing too, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, <clears throat> otherwise known as GINA, we, uh, you know, we're seeing some GINA cases. We don't see a lot of GINA cases, but it, uh, it places restrictions on asking about, um, you know, family medical history and whatnot. Uh, you know, it's something that there are exceptions to it, but uh, uh, the EOC uh, takes the position that we have to be very careful in asking for that because you could very well violate that particular statute. Well, let's talk about reasonable accommodation. There are really two statutes that deal with at the federal level that require accommodation. Um, uh, you know, main, main statutes, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, uh, Title I of the ADA, and also Title VII. <clears throat> Title one of the ADA deals with disabilities. Um, if someone is a qualified individual with a disability, uh, they're entitled to, you know, a reasonable accommodation unless it creates an undue hardship. Um, so, uh, so you've got, you know, the ADA providing a potential exemption. Then Title seven also allows uh, persons uh, where, where you have religious conflicts. If there's a religious objection. Uh, to accepting a vaccination, um, you know, you also have to provide a reasonable accommodation. And, um, you know, uh, you have to provide them, um, 
uh, you have to provide them, uh, you know, with some options. Now, what options would that be? But you have to get, you have to have to, you should consider offering alternative means for an employee to earn incentive if they can't get a vaccination due to disability or religion, uh, just to, uh, you know, avoid uh, a potential disparate treatment claim. And some of the options, watching a uh, workplace COVID-19 safety video, uh, reviewing literature on how to mitigate the spread. You know, there are, a lot, there are a lot of different options. There's a lot of resources and information out there uh, on how to, you know, uh, operate safely uh, in the current environment with COVID-19. So uh, just, just some thoughts for employers on the incentives and the, and the accommodations that are required. Uh, this is hot off the press, actually. This was uh, this this new guidance came out Tuesday, as in Tuesday of this week. Uh, uh, the VOC is taking the position that uh, that workers who contract COVID nineteen can be protected under the ADA. Um, and the VOC says you've got to, of course, look at the individual circumstances. One thing about the Americans with Disabilities Act we all need to understand is everything's real specific to the facts. So you, you look and see if um, there are three different ways you can, you can be covered as being disabled. Uh, one is having an actual impairment that substantially limits a major life activity or, uh, or a record of having a impairment or perceiving someone to have a disability when they don't. That's called regarded as. The DOC goes on and talks about if you've got, um, if you have, have COVID-19, you have multi-day uh, you know, uh, symptoms, uh, you could, you know, could have an impairment. Now, now, ordinarily under the ADA, ADA disabilities are, are typically going to be permanent. That's the normal. Um, in fact, there are exceptions uh, under the statute. You can't be regarded as being disabled if you have a temporary condition that ordinarily resolves itself within, I think, six months, and it's minor. So, you know, uh, many of us, Today, including your speaker, has had COVID nineteen, and you know uh, we've gotten through it. The people, the people here today have, if you've had it, we've lost family members who have it. Um, you know, weren't able to uh, to survive it. So it's very serious. But um, you know, ordinarily, I think most people that have it, you know, if they get sick, some people have symptoms. You know, they're over it uh, within a fairly short time, and there are exceptions. So. It is good to recognize that. I think it would be covered even if they didn't officially recognize it, but that's new guidance that you need to be aware of uh, coming out of the EOC. Now, there was guidance on long, what they call long COVID. Um, this was put out by the uh, HHS and the DOJ. Um, um, you know, it talks about the, the long COVID uh, uh, symptoms that persist. Um, there are also people are also called long haulers. Uh, we've heard a lot about it. Um, I, I think all of us probably know people who've had COVID that didn't seem to bounce back quickly. They maybe weren't seriously ill or severely ill, but they were still struggle with it. And according to the CDC, here's some of the examples of common symptoms of long COVID. Um, you know, there are a lot of them: tiredness, fatigue, difficulty thinking, shortness of breath. Um, you know, there are a lot of different symptoms that people can have, you know, and, and some of these symptoms can be, um, you know, also symptoms of other kinds of conditions. But uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of people, at least I've known, they've had trouble with it after they've had it, really had a lot of respiratory type problems, breathing problems, uh, or at least what I've seen. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, as HR professionals or, or business owners. Um, uh, you know, COVID-19, uh, don't dismiss it as uh, being a, not being a disability of the ADA, because depending on how severe it is and how long it lasts, it could very well be. So that's important to know. Uh, American Rescue Plan, this is something President uh, Biden had rolled out a number of months ago. Um, you know, you extended the tax credits for the uh, Family First Coronavirus Response Act for, for uh, companies that voluntarily elected to uh, uh, you know, to uh, um, um, allow people paid sick leave, um, you know, extended the unemployment relief, additional stimulus checks, COBRA subsidies. Uh, this this came out, uh, once again, it didn't include some of the things uh, that were campaign promises, although the 
$15 wage did, uh, did materialize for federal contractors. So these were, this was an important, uh, you know, important uh, legal development uh, that impacted labor employment area in 2021. Labor relations, um, there's probably no agency, federal agency that's more impacted um, when you have changes in administration in the LRB. Um, you know, I, I, I get tired of hearing the analogy to a pendulum that goes back and forth. Um, but anyway, it is, <laughs> it's a very fair way to describe it. Um, you have one administration that comes in and, uh, you know, they're the people they appoint. Um, the way it works, at least you have two Democrats, two Republicans, and then whoever the president's party is. Uh, president appoints someone of, of his or her party, so you so you you always end up with a majority, uh, whoever, whoever the party in power is in the White House. So uh, it, it was a three to two majority, Republican majority uh, through August. Um, there was a vacancy. There were four board members. There was one Democrat a board member and three Republicans. Um, president Biden filled the vacancy. It was there, and then when the, the Republican, uh, one of the Republicans whose term was up in August, left, uh, that person was replaced with a, uh, you know, with a Democratic uh, uh, nominee, and that person was confirmed by the Senate. So, um, so we've got, you know, we've got a new chair. Uh, uh, McFerrin uh, is the new chair, uh, former, you know, uh, very uh, has a labor union background. And her approach would be very different than the, uh, the approach of the, the last year person who, who happened to be a Republican. We talked about the NLRB top attorneys being fired uh, in the new Democratic board majority. So what are we looking at? Well, we're probably going to be looking at things that are going to affect employers, not only that have unions, but employers that don't have unions that might have unions. Uh, and um, unless you're in one of the industries that's excluded from the Labor Act coverage, which, which are very few, you know, non-governmental entities. They're going to be looking at things like election procedures. When you have elections, you know, the, uh, the Obama administration, the Obama board pushed for like very short elections, which tend to favor organized labor. The Trump board pushed back and made them, made them longer again. That's going to be something you're going to look at, joint employment. Um, you know, whether, you know, if you have two employers that both have some involvement in the, in the life of the worker, if they're both going to be joint employers, uh, that's something that they'll deal with. You know, whether you, whether employees can use the employer's email system, which was the law during the Obama administration, uh, the Trump board changed it so that they can't use it. You know, and we have we have several several areas here, big important areas. One area that really impacts employers. Um, that don't have unions or these handbook rule cases. They, they took the approach uh, during the Obama, uh, Obama NLRB days that uh, some of these work rules that employers had for years, uh, you know, they may have been there for years. They hadn't even you know, really, or even where they were still there in handbooks. Uh, the way they were written, uh, they were intimidating or chilled. The word was chill, they use uh, uh, an individual's uh, 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 I guess intent or ability to exercise their rights under Section Seven of the Labor Act, which is basically the right to engage in mutual, um, uh, you know, mutual cooperation, uh, mutual aid and protection, which can be anything from you know uh, either trying to organize a labor union, uh, trying to get rid of a labor union, uh, uh, protesting about workplace safety. Uh, you know, strikes, things like that. Uh, it's a variety of stuff. Uh, but they were invalidating these handbooks. And if someone got fired because of a rule they thought was, you know, invalid, they would, they would you know, uh, destroy the termination of the basis, basis for termination. And they would find that the employer violated the act. So these are all things uh, they're the new board is going to be looking at. Now, the PRO Act, a uh, very pro-labor bill, uh, was passed the House. Uh, it seems stalled in the Senate. Um, this is a pretty, pretty, well, very radical bill in terms of, I don't mean that 
necessarily in a negative way, but radical in the sense of bring dramatic change. Um, it would restall, uh, reinstall quickie elections, which means the employer doesn't have much time to, to educate employer, employees about, uh, uh, you know, uh, about labor unions, uh, ban captive audience meetings where the employer can get the employees together and speak to them about, uh, you know, the disadvantages of, of unions, um, which employers have a free speech right under the federal constitution, in addition to the Labor Act currently to do it. Um, this, would, this would give the employees the right to use company email to solicit each other, which makes it, you know, a lot easier, uh, to, you know, to do that, which facilitate organizing of micro units, which was something that occurred during the Obama administration where uh, the board would allow these small, small units of, of employees. Uh, one of the more famous cases was in uh, a Macy's case where uh, they organized like a shoe, shoe department at Macy's, you know, and that's how they were called uh, micro units. Um, so, um, and that, that was undone by the Trump labor board. So we may get very well go back to that. Now, if the PRO Act passes, that will pro provide statutory authority by it, uh, for it. Uh, here are other things, uh, blocking uh, strike replacements, permanent replacements, um, prohibiting arbitration agreements, um, you know, just a lot of, just a lot of changes. Uh, and what's really the goal of the PRO Act was to increase union organizing, uh, provide for greater grant, greater employee rights, uh, and, and place more restrictions on employers. Because um, really, unless the law restricts employers, um, you know, employers have, you know, have the right to run their business the way they see fit. Um, and, uh, you know, this would certainly uh, tie employers' hands uh, substantially if this passes. Um, so expanded legislation regulation, um, you know, COVID-19, we, we talked about the executive orders that came through uh, early on. Uh, a lot of it had to do with COVID-19. Uh, President Biden did call for the, you know, call for the uh, uh, OSHA to do the temp emergency temporary standard. And they, they picked, um, uh, you know, they, they, they've got the right people in place to really push it. Um, Trump administration used existing regulations and statutes. So uh, President Biden's been pushing for it. You have a bit of a divide, you had a, a divided Congress right now, particularly in the Senate. Uh, so he's had some trouble getting some of this legislation through. But let's talk about the emergency temporary standard. Now, President Biden called for it back in January. And I, you know, I thought it would come out before it did. Uh, I think it rolled out on November 5. But um, uh, anyway, uh, it got published in the Federal Register. Uh, and I think the next day, um, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals um, stayed its implementation, which uh, it's pretty common uh, to see different organizations or states, uh, business groups follow injunctions against laws and go for a nationwide injunction. Uh, and this emergency temporary standard, many of you know, um, applied to employers with 100 or more employees that weren't exempted. You either had to develop, implement, enforce a mandatory vaccination policy or allow unvaccinated employees to test regularly be subject to a mass policy and also had some other requirements. So uh, all employers were, um, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're gearing up for that. Uh, our firm is giving out, you know, advice every day to clients on how to comply with it. We're developing documentation for them. Uh, and then it gets enjoined. So, um, you know, whether or not it's going to ever go into effect, you know, don't know. Um, if you look at the emergency temporary standards that OSHA has issued over the years, um, I think the majority of them have been haven't gone into effect or they've been joined by the federal courts. Uh, the standard for issuing those is very high. Uh, it's, it's a whole lot, um, if OSHA decides to do a, a, a rule or regulation, um, normal rulemaking, uh, that would be subject to a different kind of standard and would likely, um, you know, would, 
can't really predict what the quarter would do, but it would be much easier for OSHA to defend. So right now, uh, as it stands, the emergency temporary standard is enjoined. Uh, suits got filed uh, in several places. Um, and so what happened, uh, because there were you know, different decisions, different courts, uh, there's the United States Judicial Panel on Multi-District uh, Litigation. Uh, they, they did a lottery because uh, one court was going to be selected to hear all the cases together and make a decision. So um, anyway, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the circuit that's over Tennessee, Kentucky, Michigan, and Ohio was selected. So they're, uh, uh, and, and this came out a few days ago, but a three-judge panel is going to, uh, to issue the decision uh, as ver versus all the judges uh, on the Sixth Circuit. Um, so we, uh, you know, how quickly it will will take for them to do it, don't know. Um, but with the holidays and everything, it may be you know it may be a while before we see anything. Uh, more at more litigation. Uh, the healthcare vaccine mandate uh, that came out from OSHA also got blocked. Um, uh, the court in Missouri, Louisiana, uh, blocked it. So that that is enjoined uh, from the Medicaid and Medicare services. Also, multiple courts have issued injunctions to uh, uh, enjoin enforcement of the uh, the vaccine mandate for federal contractors. In fact, there was a case that was decided. I think it was yes, it was either today or yesterday out of Louisiana. Um, this article, this link to this article below the site at the bottom of the PowerPoint, will take it to the article. But there's several courts who have done it. So all these <clears throat> all these mandates are are, are all tied up right now in litigation. And, um, you know, so we'll, we'll have to see what happens. It'll be interesting, um, you know, to see if they emerge at all, uh, if they survive or they survive in a different form. We'll have to wait for the quarters to decide. All right, workplace safety. Uh, I know we have a, a very busy uh, practice in workplace safety. Um, I've got I have the pleasure of working for one of the working with one of the leaders of our OSHA workplace safety practice. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot more enforcement activity. Um, they, they, they're hiring more uh, investigators. Uh, there's been an increase in funding. Um, when, when President Trump, during his administration, um, there were a lot fewer OSHA inspectors. In fact, uh, um, it says it was the lowest level in 49 year history of the agency. So. Um, more people, uh, where you have more investigators, you can expect, you know, more findings, more violations, more activity. So this is uh, this is going to keep all of us busy uh, for the next four years. So if you're an employer, uh, you need to really pay close attention to workplace safety issues and, um, you know, conduct audits and just get yourself prepared to you know, prepare for OSHA when they come in and do inspections. Also, penalties uh, are expected to increase and become more punitive. Wage and hour law, um, we haven't seen yet a increase in the federal minimum wage outside of federal contractors, but uh, around the country, the majority of states now have minimum wages that are higher than the federal minimum wage. Um, there are also localities that have uh, much higher minimum wages. So if you're an employer uh, and you're operating in different states, uh, know that your state, uh, maybe even city or county, may have a minimum wage that's higher than the federal minimum wage. Um, one, one of the biggest, most profound changes I've seen since I've been practicing law is just this uh, emergence of all these state uh, labor and employment laws and also local uh, labor and employment laws. In certain states like Tennessee, uh, our legislature has passed a law that says that localities can't, uh, you know, have their own uh, labor and employment laws. So we have state law, but we don't have uh, really local laws dealing with those issues. But a lot of states do. Uh, but I, I expect, uh, you know, you're seeing minimum wage increases in, you know, so-called red states like Florida. Uh, so you're, you know, you're seeing. Uh, really, um, like Florida, this Florida uh, referendum, which was approved by voters, is increasing uh, minimum wage to fifteen dollars, uh, ending um, which will which will be fifteen in two thousand twenty-six. 
it goes up incrementally every year. Also, other states have already done that. Um, penalties similar to other areas. Um, you know, DOL. Uh, one thing I know that DOL was doing um, during the Obama administration, it seemed to ease up a little bit, is they would always go with try to get liquidated damages when they would do investigations, which um, which basically doubles the amount of any wages that you owe. And um, so uh, and I, I, I suspect at this point uh, they brought that back. And so you're going to just makes it harder to settle wage an hour cases when they do that. Uh, also, uh, potential legislation to halt to include National Wage Step Protection Act. Um, you know, California has a lot of different laws dealing with um, you know, wage and hour type laws in other states do too. So uh, I think there will be a push, you know, at this point, since we have a divided, closely divided Senate, uh, it's hard to say what would pass and what would not pass, but uh, I think you'll see at least, uh, you know, major pushes at least, uh, at least in the House of Representatives in the next year or so. Uh, for those of you who are uh, uh, restaurants, we, we, represent a lot of uh, restaurant and food service employers. Uh, this 80-20 rule um, is, is being resurrected. Uh, the Trump administration had reworked, reworked the rule. Uh, the, Obama, the Biden administration has come in and basically um, you know, readopted that. If the, um, uh, the employer loses the tip credit, if the tip employee spends more than 20% of their weekly hours for rework that's not tip producing work, or that directly supports tip producing work. And uh, it defines the regulation, the rule defines what tip producing work is. So this is something for employers, you know, restaurant employers or employers that, um, you know, have tipped employees that you need to be aware of. Uh, it's gonna go into effect on December 28, which is fast approaching. Uh, one thing that the Trump administration did, which a lot of, a lot of a lot of the business community liked uh, is they made uh, wage and hour regulations had this had this joint employer rule, which made it really easy for uh, to find uh, if you had an employee who did did anything for another employer that had any kind of relationship with the employer where they you know performed ninety nine percent of their work, um, uh, you know uh, they could be labeled to be a, a joint employer. So the, the Trump administration, um, you know, changed the rule, a lot of people liked it. Um, they really tweaked the rule, they didn't radically change it, they changed part of it. Uh, well, anyway, as soon as the Obama administration came over, they proposed in March rescinding the rule. Uh, in July, they formally did it, and there was a lawsuit um, that got brought last year uh, in New York. Um, and um, uh, the court in New York, federal court, enjoined the rule, joint employer rule, got appealed to the Second Circuit. And so the Second Circuit ruled not that long ago that because the DOL had presented the rule, it made, it made the issue a moot point. But it was a you know, good rule, more flexible for business. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's gone at least for the next four years, uh, you know, depending on who wins the White House in 2000. 24, it may, may come back. Uh, withdrawal of Trump's independent contractor rule. Um, uh, many of you who uh, were um, busy uh, in, with, with HR back during the Obama administration may remember there was a memo that the Wage and Hour Administrator rolled out, I think it was in 2015, which dealt with independent contractors. And it just set out, you know, in a, in a way, uh, the, the agency's position on that, which, uh, you know, they're very heavily focused on finding that people are, uh, you know, our employees versus independent contractors, um, you know, with, with the regular, with the standards they look at. Um, and so I, I suspect that memo got withdrawn when Trump, when Trump administration took over. So I suspect it'll get reissued, but um, the, uh, the current DOL uh, the Biden DOL has uh, withdrawn the rule so that uh, the independent contractor standards in place prior to the Trump administration will, will remain the same. It's typically, it's called the economic realities test. Um, and it's got 
a few factors that you look at, uh, things like, you know, uh, it's a relationship. Is there any right of control? Is the relationship permanent or temporary? Uh, does the, uh, the alleged independent contractor have their own tools, the opportunity for profit or loss? You know, several things that they look at. So that I suspect we're going to see something going on uh, with this, uh, with the new administration, some some revisions. Um, this is a, um, you know, the, the, this is a real big issue, and for many of you who are around the country, you know, states differ radically on this. Like California has the ABC test, which makes it very very hard. Um, for, you know, for, for an employer to get away with calling someone an independent contractor. Uh, very, very strict. Uh, you have other states, for example, Tennessee, uh, which is an example of maybe the other trend that have adopted the IRS 20 factor test, which looks at a lot of different factors. So it's easier in Tennessee to, you know, in other states like Tennessee to have you know, true independent contractor relationships, you can't really go and, um, you know, say if something's truly a, a truly a, an independent contractor relationship, you know, you can't pull pull off and make it an employer. I mean, an employer relationship, you can't really make it disguise it to be an independent contractor. Uh, but anyway, uh, at least she gives you more flexibility. But uh, this is going to be a big issue. Uh, agencies differ on their approach to independent contractor. States um, um, states differ pretty widely, and so uh, this will be another. We talked about um, you know things to look for in 2022. This is going to be another big big area uh, for for HR to be uh, to have to wrestle with. Uh, wage and hour law. This is something a lot of companies do internal audits which we do, we help our clients and um, do wage independent, you know, internal wage audits, clients do them themselves. This particular case, um, uh, the client did one, I guess after they, they, were, they had some concerns about whether someone was exempt, they had lawsuits that got filed and the court allowed uh, the plaintiffs to use the internal wage, internal audit, uh, which supported their argument that they were misclassified. So, uh, this is an interesting case. Uh, the point, point there is if you're an employer, it's good to do, do audits and make sure you're complying with the law and people are properly classified, but, but, but know that uh, potentially, um, you know, it, it may come up as evidence unless you handle it. You know, having a lawyer involved, I think, helps. Uh, you can help maintain privilege. Uh, but I thought that was a, a, a significant case. Uh, assault on arbitration, you know, there are uh, some states like California have been very hostile to, toward arbitration for years. There have been a lot of cases out there. Most cases have gone to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, you know, for employers, um, you know, people have different views of arbitration. Um, you know, if you're if you're in a state which has, you know, which is not an employer friendly state that you know, has a, has a not employer friendly judiciary, jury pool, certain places within states, arbitration agreements make sense because you, you know, can circumvent that, but they also have drawbacks too. You know, in employment cases, you know, I always try to get cases dismissed. If you're for a federal judge, you know, you have a pretty good chance of uh, paying on the case, getting it dismissed. When you, in arbitration, you typically go all the way and, you know, you can't, it's hard to get things dismissed uh, if they're in arbitration. And also it's very expensive to have to pay arbitrators. So there are, there are advantages and disadvantages, but so far the Supreme Court has really um, come down strongly on the side of arbitration, the Federal Arbitration Act. Uh, but this is a target uh, because, um, you know, uh, the, the trial lawyers don't like it. Um, the, you know, labor unions don't like it. Uh, so you could, you know, we may see a real reworking of this. The Federal Arbitration Act has been around, I think, um, you know, since the early 30s and maybe even before that. So uh, that law may be, uh, there, there may be some moving Congress to uh, to amend that law, although once again, with a evenly divided Senate, it's probably going to be hard to do it. 
uh, pay equity, uh, Paycheck Fairness Act. Um, you know, it's an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, it passed the House, blocked by the Senate. Don't know if that's going to, uh, you know, going to pass, but that's that's still out there. Uh, the employers, you also need to, with all the focus on gender, you know, making sure that, um, you know, men and women are paid the same for doing similar work. You know, there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of focus and equal pay acts there. So just be aware of that uh, and make sure you don't have wage disparities uh, in your company. Uh, many of us remember the, uh, the EO component one, component two, where EOC was going to make employers collect turnover wage information, a uh, number of hours worked, uh, and that sort of came to a halt. Well, that, you know, you can see that coming back to light potentially. So, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, it's something that um, may very well be on the horizon. Uh, EOC back a few months ago issued new guidance on sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination in the workplace. Um, now the EOC long before courts, you know, courts uniformly embraced the idea, had taken the position that sexual orientation, you know, and gender identity uh, were protected under Title VII under the uh, um, discriminate under the sex discrimination based on sex prong of the statute. So uh, uh, the EOC marked the one year anniversary of the Bostock case. Um, by, um, by rolling this out, it's uh, um, it's the EOC guidance. I think it's helpful. Um, I, I I use it. I review it. Uh, I use it. You know, when I do presentations like this, I do it to advise clients. Um, even though it's not necessarily the law per se, it's certainly something the EOC goes by, uh, and it's uh, you know it's good to know. So uh, that's something out there for employers. There's a site, we have a legal alert on it. Uh, I wanna bring it to your attention because I think we're gonna see, uh, I think employers were largely complying with this even before Bostock, but uh, you know, with the, uh, the gender identity uh, uh, aspect, I think we're, we are seeing more cases uh, of alleged discrimination on the basis of gender identity. So this would be good, uh, something good for employers to take a look at. Uh, uh, your spare time, maybe over the holidays when you have a lot more free time. Uh, this is something that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, Commissioner Sonderling, who I mentioned to you, I had the pleasure of interviewing at our uh, corporate council conference earlier in the year, uh, really championed this uh, initiative of artificial intelligence and algorithm fairness. Uh, today, people, um, you know, if you're looking for a job, I mean, pretty much everything now is online. You know, you go apply. Uh, if you were looking for a job, you got to LinkedIn and apply. You go to uh, um, other uh, other websites or other, you know, many of those that you can apply on. Uh, and that's really become the way people apply for work. So, uh, and, you know, it, it, it seems like sometimes when people do apply, you know, their, their application and resume kind of vanish in cyberspace. And so, uh, you know, uh, and there've been some, there've been some suits and there've been some, uh, uh, you know, some allegations about it. So the EOC is looking into it, uh, to make sure that these, uh, algorithms that are used aren't, you know, weeding people out based on a protected trade. So, uh, this is something that, um, you know, um, I'm sure this is going to be around probably indefinitely, but this is something that you, know, you definitely need to watch, uh, and be aware of. Uh, Congress concerning the Family Act, uh, you know, paid family leave, paid medical leave uh, during COVID, uh, that was very popular. Um, you know, I think it's just a matter of time before we, you know, have have some kind of you know paid leave. I know I think President uh, Obi President Biden has pushed for it in this Build Back America uh, bill. So, uh, but there and there are several of them, but Family Act is one of them. Um, and um, uh, I think the Family Act has passed the House of Representatives. One of them has. I think it's the Family Act, but it's stalled in the Senate. Uh, the American Families Plan um, was introduced in April. Um, you know, the, this had pretty big impact, potentially big impact on uh, employers. Um, 
provide for paid leave. Um, you know, it's an ambitious proposal. So we'll see uh, if it gets any traction. You know, uh, I, I see paid leave as something that probably Republicans can get behind because it's popular. So I'm, I'm thinking you're probably going to end up getting some kind of a paid leave, uh, more permanent paid leave statute uh, enacted down the road, uh, some bipartisan measure. Uh, what about restrictive covenants? Well, restrictive covenants have always really been a creature of state law, and the law varies. I do a lot of work with non-competes. Um, they've done them really all over the country, and, uh, and the law there is changing pretty rapidly at the state level. Tennessee is a good state for non-competes, but uh, there's a trend now at the state level to validate them if pe people sign them who make under a certain, you know, hourly rate uh, or have a certain job. So, um, Nothing at the federal level, really, but there's a, there's a Workplace Mobility Act that's been introduced. It's bipartisan um, that basically would eliminate non-competes, except in you know limited circumstances, maybe in the sale of a business or something like that. Um, you know, you've got the federal defend trade secrets law that was uh, passed during the Obama administration. Um, you know, you still have trade secret protection even if you don't have non-competes. But anyway, non-competes are still valid. Uh, in, in, in many, I guess in most places, but you've got to be very aware of where you are when you have them uh, and don't use some kind of a cookie cutter uh, generic type of uh, uh, you know, agreement. Um, so, so, and here are some of the states, uh, you know, Oregon, Massachusetts, Illinois, Maryland, uh, all have recent, uh, recent changes to their statute and add Nevada too. They're even more than that. They're just a lot of them. Uh, global immigration. Uh, I just talked to my uh, colleague here in the office, David Jones. He's one of our uh, firm gurus on immigration. And uh, really, uh, he told me the biggest traumatic, the most traumatic development um, since President Biden's been in office is uh, now there's a, uh, the Trump administration had done away with this presumption that somebody had a visa if they reapplied, you know, that the new application would be, you know, okay, pretty much. They didn't really scrutinize it. Uh, um, that was pre-Trump administration. And President Trump came in and started scrutinizing the, you know, the visas, even though someone had had it, you know, maybe for years, and uh, which created a lot of work for lawyers, uh, a lot of headaches for employers and people. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot to be done in the immigration area. It's difficult to get things through Congress. It's very divided. Um, uh, but there are a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of things undone, a lot of things that need to be done in the immigration area. Um, some, some of the stuff President Trump, President Biden, oh, Biden, President Biden did the executive order. Uh, but in terms of legislation, we haven't, you know, seen any at this point. Um, what to expect from Biden, LRB, talk a little bit about it. Um, the LRB is an independent agency. Uh, Relations Act was passed back in, I think, 1935, uh, before most of us, I recall, were, were born. And basically, it was a very radical law. It, it allowed um, people to, um, uh, you know, uh, vote to be in a union, uh, to bargain collectively. Uh, also prevented employers and unions from engaging in unfair labor practices. So really, that really, there's a two-fold purpose to to allow for representation and to protect relationships that are established uh, and also to prevent unfair labor practices. So you got, uh, you know, you had a four, three to one Republican majority. Um, and now it's, it's three to two. Uh, Peter Sung Orr was replaced the, the uh, President Trump's uh, nominee, uh, Rob, and started undoing a lot of his stuff, started undoing some of the memos that uh, Rob had written. The way the general counsel works, the general counsel oversees the regional offices and they issue memorandums which uh, lay out policy based on, you know, board cases. And so um, they undid uh, a number of the memos that, that Rob did. And then Jennifer Brugio, who was sworn in at the end of July, has issued several others, including one on remedies, where she's pushing the board to adopt um, more aggressive remedies like compensatory damages, uh, which you typically don't see in board cases. Um, 
you know, so that's, those, those are coming down the pike. We expect to see, uh, you know, their, the election rules uh, during the Obama administration that came in were pretty aggressive and really helped unions. Uh, the Trump board came in and kind of balanced it out a little bit. So I, we expect to see the new board to come in uh, probably through rulemaking uh, and make, you know, kind of dial some of that back. Uh, that's going to be pretty obvious. Um, you know, and, and I think I think we'll definitely see it because that's just what happens when a new board comes in. You see things get rolled back. Um, you know, uh, one one of the one of the important cases that was decided by the Trump board back last year was if you had a you had a union come in uh, where there was not a union there before and there was no contract, uh, the employer had the right to use their existing rules to discipline employees without. You know, consulting with the union about it. Now that, that overruled a, a prior case, um, which you know, so it gave the employer more freedom. Uh, so hope you know that's a good case for employers, uh, but to expect the, the new board, the new uh, the Biden board, to change that. Uh, we talked about the Pro Act. Um, once again, it's uh, uh, you know it's very radical in terms of radical and being. It's going to make a lot of change. Uh, I don't think that's going to pass the Senate. I don't think Joe Manchin, uh, I think he's said he wouldn't vote for it, at least if that, that's his indication. Uh, but this is an evenly divided. Uh, the Democrats support it, Republicans are against it. Uh, possibly a couple of moderate Democrats are against it. Um, that's, that's the big uh, pending law on the labor area. Um, Here's a very important case. Uh, and this kind of relates to trade secrets. There's, there's a statute called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which we use uh, in trade secret cases. Uh, sometimes if we feel like uh, an employee has, you know, uh, misappropriated information from a computer, um, you know, and, and the law was not really developed and there, were, there was a lot of uncertainty about it. Well, this Van Buren case that was issued basically says that, uh, your employee doesn't violate this law if he gets if, if he or she gets information from a computer and uses it for an improper purpose, uh, even if it violates your policies or the training where you were where you gave the employee access to the computer uh, and the information in the first place. So it, it's kind of gate up or gate down. Um, so uh, you know, but it, but it does provide employers with clear guidance. Uh, but it is unfortunate that. Um, you know, that, that bright line rule, because certainly, you you know, even if someone has access to information, they shouldn't be misusing it uh, or using it for, you know, using it for wrong purpose. But um, anyway, this, the, you still have the trade secret protection you can bring, but this is an important case. Another case that's, uh, pending that hadn't been argued yet at the Supreme Court is Southwest Airlines Company versus Saxon. It's whether uh, you have workers who load and unload goods from vehicles like trucks um, who don't transport the goods but unload them, they're exempt uh, under the Federal Arbitration Act. You know, because transportation workers are exempt, like truck drivers. Uh, so this is an important case uh, uh, that the Supreme Court is going to be deciding. So anyway. Uh, that that's the end of the presentation. I uh, appreciate everybody uh, for hanging around. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a few things. Um, we've got some time, some time for questions here, if there are any questions. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of kick that back over to you. Um, well, yes, so. yeah, absolutely. Um, um, we have two questions. The first one being, if a tipped employee does more untipped work just once in a while, does the 80-20 rule only apply to the pay periods that this occurs? Uh, I think, I think, you know, we probably need more guidance from DOL on this, but I think probably would invalidate, require the employer to pay the minimum wage uh, for those periods where it did occur. Uh, I think that would, be, I think that would be the way it would, you know, would apply the it wouldn't be permanent, but it would be for the periods where they didn't observe that, you know, uh, that split. Um, also, I see another question here. Even my fan, my business only has five employees and family. I will apply to me. Um, 
Well, I need to go back and look at the look at the, uh, the threshold on there. Uh, five employees is uh, that that law hasn't passed, and five employees is pretty low. Uh, I would think probably as they get it, as the law goes through the process of, um, I think if it passes the, I think if it passes the Senate, you're going to end up having some changes made in it through the conference committee. So uh, I think five employees. Um, it's probably the end result would be more than that. Uh, most of the federal laws, like the Title VII, applies to if you have uh, I think 15 or more. Uh, some of the state law apply apply to employers that have fewer workers. But uh, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't know that I don't know that it'll come out with that. That's an awful low number. All righty. It looks like those are all the questions for today. All right, well, listen, thank you, Anna. Thank you, folks, for uh, 